it's a real honor and a treat to be here with you guys uh, today to talk about this uh, really amazing, interesting field. And I think it's sort of, it almost to me feels like it's a unique uh, thing in, our, in, in the world of art, uh, surface and product uh, design. And so I, I thought I would uh, start by just sort of reading briefly this, the, the uh, description or the outline of what this category is uh, in the uh, Society of Illustrators. Annual. And so surface and product design includes work appearing in uh, three dimension, uh, including illustrations created for merchandise, such as carpets, pillows, rugs, clothing, food and beverage labels, as well as repeat patterns seen on uh, wrapping paper, wallpaper and other various textiles. Uh, it also includes installations, which is really what we're going to be seeing from uh, all our presenters here tonight. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I thought I would uh, uh, introduce the way we're going to do this is we're going to each uh, uh, artist is going to make their presentation, show their work, uh, uh, probably 10, 15 minutes uh, on each. Uh, there will undoubtedly be questions from you guys. Uh, Lindsay will be re uh, uh, recording those and then we will have a discussion at the end rather than during the presentations. Um, so our first presenter is going to be Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Curie. Uh, Sebastian is a Argentinian illustrator and animator based in Los Angeles. He creates colorful characters using big, bold shapes and strong lines. Uh, originally an animator, Seb went uh, about 10 years in the animation industry before switching uh, disciplines to focus on illustration. Uh, his experience allowed him to develop a unique style uh, centering around quirky figures who live in their own super stylized universe. And thanks to the animation background, he's uh, able to animate those uh, as well. And he's worked for clients like Apple, Venmo, Uber, Spotify, The New Yorker, Warby Parker, and others. So with that, Sebastian, um, the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I am, uh, I'm super nervous to be the first guy. <laughs> um, let, me, let me share my screen um, and we can start. Thank you for inviting me. I am I'm super happy to participate um, on this. So can you can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks yeah? good. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Um, so as Mark said, uh, my name is Sebastian Curry. I run a small studio here, just just me in, in Los Angeles. Um, I I jumped very recently to illustration. I used to be uh, an animation director, so I, my main background is three D animation and a lot of uh, keyframe animation, motion graphics, and I used to work a lot for uh, TV channels. So I, I did a lot of uh, branding. And two years ago, I just felt that illustration was uh, a better place for me. It felt uh, more authentic and I just make the jump. Uh, so I wanted to show you some of my, my previous stuff without, um, without going too deep on any stuff. Um, I do I do a lot of animation. Um, that's what I usually um, love the most, I would say. Uh, and I am still trying to find a language and, and my voice within illustration. Illustration is very broad and I just been um, working on, on a lot of different projects. Uh, a lot of them are just like these silly, um, small animations, but then I also did uh, um, whatever, a type of um, project collaboration I could jump in because I was uh, excited. Um, so over the last two years, uh, I did some some murals, some um, uh, clothing, uh, carpets, um, a lot of uh, a, a lot of of my short experience says that I usually do these uh, visuals and then the client. Uh, takes them to other purposes. Uh, the project that I want to talk today is a store for Warby Parker that is in Vancouver. Um, at that time, I was in, I, I, I used to move a lot, not with the pandemic, but I'm originally from Buenos Aires and I moved to LA a couple of years ago and then I moved again to, to Vancouver. And they were they were trying to, to work with uh, a local artist. And I was kind of like a local artist because I was there at that time. Um, so they were kind enough to to bring me bring me on this this project. Um, and 
as I said before, all of these projects, they, they start just uh, like this, flat to the illustrations uh, based on the language that I usually work. And, and some of them, uh, they, are, they have a purpose and they are defined and, and I, can, I can know where they're gonna be living, but usually that's not the case. The case is usually they need strong visuals and I should just create a piece that I don't know where it's gonna live. And, and then the client and a team just takes it uh, to the street like this one. Um, my, as you can see, you know, the work that I do is mainly character driven. I, I really like to, to work with people. I draw a lot of it and, and I don't know why, you know, it's kind of like a subject that uh, I started almost uh, randomly and it kept growing with the years. And now I just feel it resonates a lot with me just to draw people and, and work with that, uh, with that subject. So in 2020, um, I did these uh, glasses for a holiday party. I think it was New Year's Eve party for Warby Parker to celebrate 2020. And uh, I thought that it was funny to show this because 2020 ended up being an um, awful year. But, uh, but um, we, I had uh, big expectations. So the, the projects that I have for you is this one. Um, and initially, um, they were, they were looking for a local artist to create this uh, store. Uh, if you know Warby Parker, they, they work on, they have glasses, uh, they, they sell some books also, and they have a very strong uh, visual identity that they take a lot of uh, uh, care for sure. And it's, um, and it's just like a beautiful brand to collaborate if you're an illustrator, because uh, if you travel a bit and you, and you visit some of their stores, they're always, um, they're always outstanding. Uh, the, the murals they have, uh, they are, they're very carefully picked and the artists they select, um, they are very interesting. Uh, here in, in where I live in Los Angeles, uh, one of my biggest influences is uh, Jeff McCurridge and on Venice he did a mural. So when they, when they asked me to create a mural for them, I was uh, I was super excited. Uh, but also, I was uh, getting married at the time, so I was in the middle of my um, uh, what is the English uh, word for uh, vacations when you go to with your wife uh, the um, the honeymoon. Uh, I was in the middle of my honeymoon, and um, it was a bit problematic because I had to do all this project uh, during that. And um, so what I, what I tried to, what, what I tried to create with this project, uh, they gave me some of the layout, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't complete at that stage. And what I tried to do is to create uh, some link with the city, uh, with Vancouver. And if you've been to Vancouver, it's a city that is very small um, and it has um, a lot of green spaces. Uh, people is very active. Um, wellness is a big part of the city. Um, you could see a lot of activities outdoors, um, even when rain, because it rains a lot. Uh, and and when I went there, I just was uh, very uh, surprised by um, keys, because there are keys everywhere in Vancouver. And also the relationship with uh, the keys and people of Vancouver is pretty nice. Uh, they stop cars even in the middle of an uh, avenue or something just to uh, just to leave them be, you know, they walk around the city and that was pretty cute. And also people are just very kind, you know, Canadians are, are the best. So I started working with this, uh, with these animals uh, and just glasses. I usually try to draw a lot of um, stuff. It could be arbitrary, it could start from, from anywhere. Um, but, um, but I need to create a big volume of, of, of work to, to represent kind of like the, the body of work that is gonna be guiding uh, the rounds of sketches that we're gonna do with the client. Uh, they didn't have a theme at the beginning, you know, the briefing was very free. It was more about to create a collaboration with an artist that was local and to represent some, some of that uh, local artist in the store. So I had to decide what to do. And they have this tagline, uh, 
um, that is nice to see you. So I just started to draw very silly uh, small sketches um, that could be around books, could be around people, could be around uh, reading. Um, I'm gonna be a bit faster with this one. And it could be about relationships between uh, kind people and 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 just keys because they're everywhere. Um, and I at that point I was working a lot with with love and it's just people like people hugging and people giving kisses. So uh, that was also reflecting here. So at this stage, I didn't have any anything uh, defined. And on the first round of sketches, this is what I presented. I, I had this small uh, layout. The, in the center, you can see the desk that receives you in the, in the store. And then they have uh, two doors where the storage space um, was going to be. So I, I presented a bunch of options around people with glasses, uh, people having uh, some fun, friends and kids and sports, uh, people reading. Uh, kisses, stuff like that. And I usually, what I do is on the first round of sketches, I try to give to the client as much as I can, just because I like to guide all the process uh, by work, you know, by work that I do and not ideas. I'm not really good at talking so or speaking, but, uh, but I prefer to create a lot of work and just uh, give it to the client. And then we could talk about or discuss about what happened on those uh, drawings and, and we could decide what is better. Uh, what feels right. So all of this is the first round of sketches um, that was done in, I think, a week or something like that um, on an iPad. Um, so I can, I was very excited to, to create this, this project. So I sent, I think, uh, around 20 sketches. Those are, are some part of that. And when I sent that, they really liked them, but they wanted to see the tagline, you know, uh, nice to see you was, uh, it, it is a big part of the brand and they wanted to have that. So I created this sketch for them. Um, and Vancouver, um, Vancouver has, uh, this part of the city that is, um, um, uh, uh, seawalk, right? So uh, you can see a lot of people just, uh, having activities there, you know, just walking and enjoying the scenery or, uh, making exercise. So I, I thought that it would be, would be nice just to have some part of that. And the neighborhood that the store is in, uh, it's on the beach. It's very close to the beach. So some of that um, landscape it was represented here. Um, I sent this a second round, but they really liked the first one. And they were uh, they were kind enough to, to choose one from the first one. They, they rejected that and they they said, uh, let's, let's, let's try to explore um, colors on, on this that we, we love. So we started working on this one. And when I work with color, um, I have to say, I feel uh, that I don't have a formal education. So everything on, on my process, I feel is very intuitive. Um, I studied some graphic design, but just a couple of years and I'm mainly an animator. So when I work with color, I try to choose pieces that I like and I feel they have the energy or, or the color harmony that I, that I feel right for the brand. Uh, this is not the Warby Parker uh, guidelines at all, but this is kind of like how I like to work with just choosing pieces that have proportion colors that I feel uh, resonate with the, with the project. And then I just go back to the initial sketch and I start to block in shapes and see how that results on on the on this case the mural and i sent them this uh and they were happy enough um they wanted to add some books and some little tweaks here and there and i think that was it this is the final result um it is uh I, i'm super happy with it but it is pretty cool just to see um your work on on a space you know on a storage uh the store it is still in vancouver and i am mainly a digital illustrator i work usually for phones and uh screens so to have something on that size uh, on a city that i live with it's amazing thank you really nice beautiful stuff 
Um, thanks, Sebastian. That was that was really wonderful. Um, our next uh, presenter is Marcos Chin. Uh, Marcos is in New York. He's an award-winning illustrator. His work has appeared on books and CD covers, surface designs, advertisements, and magazines. Uh, some of his clients include Target, Neiman Marcus, Fiat Time, Rolling Stone, Sports Illustrated, GQ, and Vanity Fair. Uh, transplant from Toronto, Canada, where they manufacture great artists. Uh, Marcus graduated from Ontario College of Art and Design and moved to New York City in 2005. Uh, he's uh, given lectures and workshops in the US and abroad and is currently an adjunct professor uh, at uh, New York School of Visual Arts. Marcus, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, and Sebastian, thanks for this shout out to Canada. I'm from Toronto, so. Um, so it's weird that I'm a bit nervous because I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> it's probably the most comfortable place I could be. But um, again, I just want to thank you all for coming. And now, Mark, Yuko, Sebastian, Lindsay, um, thank you. So when I was trying to come up with what to show today, um, it actually spawned from a conversation that uh, we all had prior to this. And I was thinking about, you know, what is surface product design uh, through illustration? And one of the things that we talked about, um, thankfully to Mark, uh, was that one of the ways that surface designs can be perceived through illustration is, as, is, is um, via sort of conveying an emotion or some kind of feeling. So it's not necessarily in the front of or front stage, but it is incorporated into the entire brand. Um, and then another thing that came up was um, us discussing um, how surface and product illustration is different from editorial. And this actually stood out to me um, in a positive way because a lot of my business is rooted in um, editorial illustration. I do a lot of uh, projects for magazines and newspapers. Um, and I've been doing it for quite a long time. And what struck me when I was thinking about it was that I have only recently been doing surface um, designs. Even though I've been working for over 18 years, it's only until maybe about less than 10 years ago that I've been sort of you know, developing some momentum into um, this particular category. And so I thought that was a good place to start to highlight a few projects, um, focus on how I began one of the first projects, I think that was a pivot point in my career, and then show you one of the final products that I have done um, in this particular category. So I'm going to share my screen right now. So I'm using PowerPoint. I already got some flack for that. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's begin. So this is a really great starting point, I think. Um, I view Suno as my, you know, the beginning of my, um, you know, exploring surface design in a different way. Suno is a fashion design team, or they were a fashion design team in New York City. Um, I took a sabbatical seven years ago from the School of Visual Arts and decided that I wanted to explore something that I've always wanted to do, which is work for fashion designers or work within fashion. And so um, during that time, I studied night school continuing ed at FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology, where I learned how to sew, drape clothing, um, make patterns, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, around this time, I also thought, you know, in order to expand my learning, I would intern with some fashion designers and Suno was one of them. And I specifically chose Suno and a couple of other designers because they were part of the CFDA, um, which stands for the Council of Fashion Designers of America. They weren't huge corporations. And I, and I wanted to work for companies that were smaller because I wanted to have more of an intimate connection with the creative team. And I think this was a really good idea. And so um, when I began at Suno, it was like you know, any other internship. I go for it around, I pick things up, drop things off. But then them knowing that I worked as an illustrator and taught at SVA, they asked me if I wanted to do some print development. And so I said yes, um, even though I'd never done it before. Um, when we were talking about 
the significance of surface and you know, surface design um, as it relates to illustration, something came up, like as I mentioned, which is that you know, our illustrations become incorporated into the brand. And this is sort of what happened when I worked at Suno. Even though I did the prints, um, I didn't do the design of the clothing. And so these illustrations of mine just became, no, I don't want to say just, they became part of the overall Suno brand. Um, and this was something that, you know, I was okay with. It isn't a good or a bad thing. It just is a thing. Um, the cool thing about working in this particular design firm or studio was that I was able to sit in in all of the meetings and I was there from sort of beginning to the end of the process. So um, I was able to collaborate with the designers. Um, once I did the artwork, it got shipped to another company who sort of catted it up, did vector sort of drawings of it, and then it got sent to the factory where it became um, embroideries or um, jacquards, that type of thing. And so, you know, what my experience before that as an illustrator working within this particular space, I would create the illustrations, give it to an art director, or design director, and then they would put it on an object, a three-dimensional object, like a bottle or a car or a graphic tee. Um, but this was really, really, really different. And so what you're seeing here are some of the um, surface designs, prints and textiles that I did for Suno. Um, you can't really tell, but these are not all printed with ink on fabric. Some have been embroidered. The one on the left here, this is a jacquard. Um, and so it was really cool seeing my work translated in different ways. So once it was, and I, I can show you some more of it. This is actually um, some scarves that I did for them. Um, they're all hand done, watercolor, gouache, ink. But once I created the artwork, uh, which is on the left here, it would, set, it would be sent to a company um, that, as I mentioned, would turn it into sort of a CAD file, I guess it was like a vector um, file. And then that would be printed, like I said, on um, fabric and then turned into a garment. And this happened over and over again. And, and like I said, it was really, for me, an important thing to see because I'd never really seen my work translated in this capacity before. And one thing that I think, um, really stood out uh, was that prior to this, I, as I mentioned, I did do some surface designs, but it wasn't in this capacity. Um, and I, I worked on three New York Fashion Weeks um, with Suno. And I think around this time, um, things started to change in the way that clients started to call me to work on these types of projects. And, you know, having worked in the industry for as long as I have, I still have to prove myself uh, in a way where um, if clients haven't seen a certain project that I've done, or if they haven't seen me do a particular thing, they want to see an example of it. And I think doing this for free, because I did work, I work here for almost a year for free, although they paid for my lunches. Um, <laughs> uh, having this in my portfolio really helped, I think, um, convince people that, hey, Marcus could be someone who we would like to see his work on our products. And so around this time, shortly after, I started to work with Michael Kors, um, paid. And so um, this was an example, again, of seeing my work in a different way, translated onto fabrics. In this instance, it was men's leather billfold wallets. He wanted to create um, Zodiac wallets where each wallet represented um, a sign of the Zodiac. And so this is how it began. It's all hand done analog, except for the sort of equatorial lines that you see in the background. And initially with the design team, we thought that um, we could just, I could create just this one large piece and then sort of divvy it up and turn it into 12 wallets, but it just wasn't possible. And so what I had to do was literally um, design and lay out each particular wallet. Um, and then it was produced in that capacity. And shortly after that, I got called by Sweaty Betty um, in athleisure line in the UK, uh, women's athleisure. I think they do only women's. And this wasn't a new project. This was actually something that I had licensed out to them. I'd done this project for a magazine called Hers probably, I don't know, 10 years ago. And this has, has, a real, has had a real long shelf life. Um, and so I sold them the rights to use this just for one season and they turned it into, so this is the original image actually. And then they turned it into um, a two piece, um, two piece gym outfit, I guess, at leisure outfit. And one thing that I want to say, because I know there are probably students here and emerging illustrators who are just starting out. Um, I don't have much experience with licensing, but one thing I do want to say is that um, when people pay you or hire you 
to create a project. They're not just hiring you to do the work, they're also hiring you to use it. And so that's one of the cool things about being an illustrator and sort of holding onto your rights, your copyrights, your moral rights, because you can always resell your images if you own them uh, and you should own them. Um, and so to reinforce what I had said sort of at the top of my presentation, even though these images all sort of uh, showcase my work, my drawings, they still, um, you know, at the core, uh, represent and fall under an overall brand. So they become sort of uh, uh, incorporated into Michael Kors or into Sweaty Betty or into Suno, that type of thing. All right, so the next project I wanted to highlight is something that I've worked on recently. Um, it was just installed, uh, I think earlier this year, it's called The Gardeners. It's for uh, PS 129 in Queens, New York. It's through Percent for Public Art School Construction Authority and the New York Cultural Affairs. I think I got all the names right. Um, this is a glass installation. It's a glass mural, sorry, at that particular public school. I chose to um, highlight this piece because I think uh, even though it is surface design um, through illustration, it, it actually puts my artwork um, in the foreground. So in this particular instance, the artist is present. Um, I'm not, you know, this artwork isn't there to necessarily sell SCA or percent for public art or, you know, the, New York City Cultural Affairs, the artwork is in the foreground. And so um, I thought this would be a good example to share information and give you some sort of tips as well, because um, not to digress too much, but if you're interested in, um, you know, finding more about how you can sort of be involved in these projects, um, you can always go to, and I know it sound, I, I sound like I'm promoting them, um, but, you know, it's very helpful. Just go on to nyc.gov and you can find a lot of information on open call for entries for public art comp competitions. Um, MTA is always looking for artists to, um, you know, for their subway stations. Um, one cool thing about New York City is that um, it, it um, devotes 1% of the construction budget to public art. Um, and so if a new school is being built, or in my case, if a school is being retrofitted, then um, they need public art in it. And so that's sort of what happened. So it's not necessarily, you know, not technically 1%, but money is devoted to putting public art within that space. Um, and so how it began was in a very straightforward way, like how I began, you know, um, I started with sketches and then from the sketch stage, I kind of developed it into a final, but um, sort of rewinding a little bit um, about, you know, this process, uh, there was something else sort of involved. Um, before I got the project, I had to present to a panel. And in the particular panel, I had to show the development of my idea, uh, as well as an artist statement, uh, materials I was going to use or thinking about using and how I would allocate, you know, the budget because um, these projects, they actually tell you what the budget is right off the bat and you have to spend the money accordingly. And so this is some of what I showed them. So again, on the left is my rough sketch. In the middle is um, the rough sketch is a skeleton and I work in vectors. And so you're just seeing a little bit of vector work. And then the third drawing here is some inspiration. So because obviously, you know, I hadn't done the project yet, they wanted sort of a vision of, of what I believe the final art artwork would look like. And um, a tip for those of you who are interested in sort of going this path, one thing that I think is very important is if you do choose to, you know, present or you get shortlisted to, you know, present to the panelists, um, they do want your final artwork to look like the work in your portfolio. Um, that's something that they sort of underscored. And so again, this is what I showed. One thing about um, uh, surface design in this particular instance that's unlike editorial is the fact that um, it needs to exist in a three-dimensional space. And so in this, project. This illustration sat in a public school. It was on the main floor. It was in between, um, not in between, but it was in a hallway that kind of connected the classrooms with the playground. And thematically, um, because it was in a school, I was thinking about um, 
sort of education, uh, collaboration as the practice of freedom. And so that's what I kind of use. And so in this illustration, you see characters and bugs and insects and creatures kind of, kind of collaborating to create something um, that feels more extraordinary than just a flower. Another thing about um, surface design that um, I had to think about was also materiality. And I don't think about that when I work on magazines or newspapers. Sometimes I might think about the paper that the artwork's printed on, but in this case, materiality was really important. Um, what is it made of? Um, and how does that material uh, interface or dialogue with the picture? And how does the picture or the illustration interact or dialogue with the material? Um, and like I said, this was made of glass. And so I'll show you a little bit about what it looks like um, in the later slides. Third thing is also the size. This was nine by nine feet. Um, initially, we didn't know the size. And so I just did a, you know, a regular vertical piece. But having seen it was nine by nine feet, I had to change the dimensions. And so we just popped it out into a square. And my process isn't linear in the sense that I do sketches and then go straight to final. Sometimes I'll do sketches, work into the final, stop, rethink it, maybe do a few changes and then continue on to the final. I might do some color adjustments. Here you can see I'm adding some more creatures, um, you know, some bubbles, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the way I work. I won't say that it's unorthodox, but it definitely is not linear. Um, and so once I finish the final artwork or I usually, you know, I've done a few of these, so I plot it on the architectural diagram and then move forward from there. So here are some of the samples. This project was interesting because I think it was an example of how obstacles can become opportunities. I went in there not knowing anything about um, public art making you know glass murals or that type of thing so this is actually a digital printed image sandwiched in between glass so it's glass laminate um and so it was a really quick learning curve for me but i had a lot of help you know they give you you know project manager and team and a list of fabricators etc who, who you can work with and so when i did my presentation i thought it was going to be a mosaic mosaic tile or glass ceramics but we soon realized that if I went in that direction, it actually wouldn't um, retain the integrity of my work. It would probably make it look not like my work. And so, and also there was a budget constraint as well. We had to, you know, only a certain amount of money that we could spend for production. And so this was the most feasible way to go, digital print, glass laminate. And you see here, I've kind of divided into six panels. That's because we knew that the glass was going to be so thick and heavy and we needed to make sure that it wasn't going to fall off the wall. Um, so dividing it into six panels in this way was something that, you know, I was considering. I made this piece sort of, I, I made this glass panel larger because I didn't want to interfere too much with the illustration. I didn't want to put a seam right through the drawing. Um, but again, this was only sort of investigation exploration. So you can see here, this is the, these are the glass panels. Um, they're about a quarter of an inch thick. The interlayer goes in between that. There's another panel on the back, and then there's another, there's a third panel. So it ends up being about three quarters of an inch, maybe, you know, 0.8 inches, something like that. Um, and this is, this is an example of um, uh, the part of my image that I wanted to get produced as a sample. So I had thought about doing a smaller, like a smaller um, size down version of my artwork um, with all of the details, et cetera. But I was afraid that um, once it was blown up, you know, things would get messed up. And so what you're seeing here is literally just, I think it's 12 by 12 inches, one by one feet sample actual size of the part of the image that I wanted to have produced. And I chose this particular section of the mural because it had the most color, it had the most detail. And also around this time, I was thinking about um, not just printing one layer and sandwiching it into two sheets of glass. I actually wanted to create a shallow diorama. So I think I had four sheets of glass and I think it was about you know well over an inch and it was super heavy. But I thought there would be some really beautiful moments uh, with the interlayers sort of um, sort of 
you know, in front of the other, there would be some cast shadow effects, that type of thing. Um, I thought having this kind of shallow diorama could have made it feel very special. But um, when we got the samples in, th these are not great photos, sorry. This one on the left is um, the shallow diorama with, I think, I think four pieces of glass. And the reason why it's so, the, cutter, the colors are so subdued is because these interlayers had to be printed on uh, translucent material, transparent material. Um, it had a little bit of a sort of warm yellow tinge or beige tinge, but ultimately, you know, layering these colors together to get that kind of um, depth effect really, you know, messed with my uh, color saturation. And going into this process, one of the things that I did want to um, keep intact was to have the piece be really, really colorful, you know. Um, one of the words that I sort of came to mind was joy. I wanted to feel joyous. And so this one on the right um, is where we went. And I had a lot of samples made. I worked with, oh gosh, I even did a, I even went on a stained glass tour. There's a, a guy who makes and re repairs stained glass near Union Square. Um, it was incredible, but I, I spent a lot of time and thousands of dollars on samples. Um, but in the end, I was really happy with um, these two on the right. Um, and we agreed that even though it would be one um, layer uh, or printed interlayer uh, behind a sheet of a quarter inch thick, thick glass, it's still, you know, for some weird reason, the glass made the, the print, the illustration feel special. So it didn't feel like I was just looking at a poster. There was something strange that the glass did um, to the colors and to the actual image. This is the reason why I did so many samples because this is an example of not a blurry photo, but um, a sample that came back. And I had this fabricator do it five times. Thank God he did not um, charge me. I just had to return them. But, um, you know, I met with them in person and they had really beautiful work, but for some reason um, their sample, they couldn't do uh, prints in the way that I wanted to. So um, I ended up going again back to this company here. They're called Pulp. They're in California. Um, and here's another ruined sample as well. And so in the end, we decided um, once we agreed on the thickness and the weight of the glass, each of these panels are about 300 pounds, that we could have only three panels, which I liked much, you know, I was more, I was happier with that decision. The seams do go through and cut through vertically the image, but when we did a test and sort of stepped back from the, from the um, samples sort of, we, we sort of tiled them together and had them about one eighth or a quarter of an inch apart, uh, you really couldn't see the seams. So it didn't interfere with the image. It's sort of read entirely as one. So here it is in California at Pulp Studio. Um, Yuko, we were, this is what I was doing when we were in Brazil and I was freaking out um, because uh, with COVID and with, you know, all the, with the pandemic and everything, things were just, you know, were being stalled and I was getting so um, nervous and oh my God. And then I was in grad school too. So I was just feeling so stressed around that time, but thankfully they got it done. The colors look fantastic. Um, one thing um, which was cool about working with pr this particular uh, fabricator is that um, I had a really close relationship with the printer too. Um, everything was really open. Project manager was amazing. Um, and things actually went smoothly and we had it installed you know, on time. And here is the final install. So again, it's in Queens. It's in College Point, Queens. Um, and here's some details of it. We you decided to use some metal standoffs, which were about an inch away from the wall. I learned a lot from you know this particular project. Um, as I said, this is an example of how an obstacle can become opportunity. Um, I really think uh, it's important to, even if you're afraid, to sort of step into that fear experience, um, especially if you know your strengths and weaknesses and really trust yourself. I think it can really result in um, amazing um, experiences. And this was one of them. And one of my huge takeaways was communication. Um, it was really important to communicate with the people who I work alongside and who worked alongside of me. I also learned the importance of um, asking for help. Um, sort of a side note to that, um, I love texting. <laughs> I love <laughs> cellular phone technology because I was constantly texting my project manager and 
uh, the fabricator in California. And last but not least, um, one of the huge takeaways from this was if you don't know something, just admit it, you know, because I didn't know so much. And, um, you know, uh, I came out of this just, you know, um, I just learned so much. So, oh, and that's my handle. <laughs> okay, here we go. So that's it. Terrific. Absolutely beautiful stuff. Thanks. Uh, and I'm really uh, impressed with the, with the degree to which you were involved, you know, particularly with this project, uh, with all these various parts of it. Uh, and sort of working with fabricators. And that's something that I think a lot of people are interested in, me included. Um, so thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, so um, I will uh, present uh, next. And um, I, if you want to know who I am and don't already, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. So you can look, you can look it up. Uh, but um, um, I'm going to show, I've, I've over a number of years worked in, in uh, a lot of areas of uh, surface and product. Um, but uh, strangely, in the last two years, three years, and particularly during the, the pandemic, I've done a, a virtually exclusively uh, projects that are either packaging related or uh, in some way related to surface and product. Uh, so while I feel like it's a new category for me, uh, in some ways, uh, it's, it's something that um, um, has grown and become a big part of what I do. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen. You'll also discover if you haven't already that I'm, I'm a Luddite, so I'm not very good at this technology thing. I, um, I am a traditional painter. So uh, and it shows in my presentation skills here. Let me see. Me. I'm looking for the enter full screen. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I said, I've worked a lot uh, with uh, packaging, uh, uh, a great deal with alcohol, uh, uh, different beverage uh, companies. And um, I, uh, I, I think it's going to be an interesting thing. Uh, Marcus touched on, on a little bit, uh, and I think uh, would be, I'd love to hear more from other people about how the, this sort of side of their, their uh, work and their business uh, developed. For me, it's, it was a very much an organic uh, thing. I was approached uh, once to do uh, some beverage uh, and packaging uh, stuff uh, related to some mostly really uh, work that I do for galleries. And as a result of that, I've sort of become uh, someone who does uh, quite a bit of that now. So this was for a, a, a scotch and, and um, uh, actually through a design firm in England. Uh, and the peat monster was, was essentially a logo that they had. So the type and the, and the monster itself were, were sort of an existing icon, but really just an icon. And so my job was to, with this 10th anniversary issue was to, to create an environment and a story uh, that took elements from uh, the company's founding and, and, uh, and uh, to build that into a special label. Uh, so for the 10th anniversary issue, uh, this, this label was produced uh, and about uh, two years later, they uh, uh, approached me again to now make this the official label that they use on all the, all the products. So, um, Marcus touched on this a little bit, and you'll see in my presentation, I'll touch on it again as well. But the idea of uh, understanding the licensing and, the, and controlling the rights that you have to your images is really important because uh, uh, it can produce revenue down the road, not just uh, for projects that uh, you would do for a client, uh, but also uh, pieces that you do for yourself, uh, which then can become pieces that uh, can be licensed. Um, so, uh, this is a series of, uh, kind of interesting, fun, uh, projects that I've been doing with Pentagram for, this is about 10 years now. I've been, I've done about 80 labels, uh, for advanced nutrients. I'm working on two of them right now. 
And um, the, this is a, they're basically, they're a hydroponic nutrients company, a nicer, politer way of saying they help people grow pot. And um, it turns out that, that uh, the pot growers, hydroponic growers, are very much like uh, wine uh, connoisseurs and that they are very into the intricacies, the, the details of their product and how, how they can enhance this quality or that quality of a, of a plant. And so Advanced Nutrients creates all these different uh, products that, that serve you know, to, to do exactly that, bring out certain elements of a, of a product. And so they had, they had an existing line uh, working with DJ Stout at Pentagram, who's somebody I've worked with for many, many years uh, when he was at Texas Monthly. Um, we have a, a long relationship and he knew my work with animals and characters and, and so uh, asked me to, to work on this project. And basically they'd send me information on uh, various products, uh, just written information. And then I would come up with crazy characters based on that. Uh, and then they would do this design. And the idea was inspired by, you know, the old vegetable crepe uh, art. And um, so it was a really fun project. As I say, it, it continues to be something that we're working on uh, to this day. Uh, this is a project that has just recently in the last couple of months uh, broken, a really fun one. Um, came through a design firm, CF Napa in California that I've worked with for a number of years doing uh, I've done a lot of wine labels and various different packaging projects with them. Uh, and they approached me for uh, a, a distillery still Austin that's actually located here in Austin, Texas. Um, and they were looking, uh, their, their brand is obviously very much about Austin and they wanted uh, to work with an artist uh, who had these roots. And, uh, and the idea was really to, to uh, uh, create a, a, a body of paintings for various different products that they have with the, um, with the jumping off point of, of sort of a muse or uh, various muses of the creative, creative base that is Austin, Texas. So the musician, the naturalist, there are a few others that are gonna be coming out. Uh, the artist is one, for example, uh, and each of these will be for a different uh, alcoholic beverage. Uh, but with the idea that Austin is this unique creative place. So I had to really kind of go back into my art historical background and, and sort of think about the idea of fates and, and various muses and, and how you could embody um, something, I mean, something as ethereal as, as music, uh, as a musician into a, to a character. Uh, as this project evolved, they really loved this red bird, which I had created as sort of an idea of music that's become the symbol of, of creativity that's, that's gonna be the link that, that runs through all these different packages. So that's, uh, the first one came out a few months back. Uh, the Gen just came out this last week. Uh, it's been really fun to, to work with these guys. We have a, we uh, are about to start or we are in talks about doing a, a mural as well. So a large scale uh, painting. Uh, I wouldn't. I would be doing it as I've usually done these things on a, uh, and as I've done my installation work, on a panel, and then that's transferred onto a surface. Um, I also thought uh, uh, when we were in discussions with Marcus uh, before, uh, and he brought up a, a kind of an interesting point. I thought and it was uh, really about the interactive quality of a lot of surface and product um, pieces. Um, because it, uh, uh, there are so many possibilities for ways to, to work as Marcus did with, with uh, different vendors and people that have different skills. Um, but uh, there are also possibilities within a project like this that don't exist in, a, in, for example, a typical editorial project. So this was a, I've done a lot of album covers over the years, but this was for Vinyl Moon and uh, was um, a really interesting concept they have for these albums. Uh, is they bring together a, a, a different songs from different artists with themes and they are collector albums. And so they, the albums themselves have, uh, are, are really highly uh, uh, produced, beautifully uh, uh, manufactured, and they have sort of hidden little treats and, and stickers and various things that become a part of it. So as an artist, I was really able to uh, completely embrace the design of this uh, and do, um, art really pretty much as I wanted using this record format. Um, so you can see, you can see a little bit of an indentation here in the back in the, in the inside flap where there was a, a 
that you could peel back and, and get out stickers and some little hidden treats inside this. It's a really great project to work on. Um, about two and a half years ago, something like that, I was approached by Gucci. Um, and uh, initially I was uh, asked to do um, uh, a couple of paintings for uh, their DIY collection, which uh, uh, are sweaters and cardigans that are personalized. And what they wanted me to do is basically just do, they had apparently been following my work on Instagram. So one good thing about technology um, and um, had decided uh, that they, they'd like for me to do, they liked my animal uh, work. And so they really said, do whatever you wanna do. So the dream client. Uh, and uh, just as long as one of our sweaters is uh, in the piece. And so uh, I did a sketch, uh, did a couple of sketches for them. And as it turned out, they wanted one piece. And once they saw the, the two sketches that I sent them, they said, we like them both. And so the, a project that was one painting became uh, two commissions. And that grew into a much longer uh, and much uh, more involved relationship with them. Uh, shortly after that, they took one of my existing paintings, and this goes back to Marcus's uh, discussion about licensing and holding onto your rights. Uh, this is a painting that I actually created for a, uh, was commissioned for a, a, a collector. Uh, this was a private uh, uh, commission, but I retained the, the secondary rights to all, all my uh, artwork, including the work that I have in, in gallery. So Gucci approached me uh, and, about licensing this image. Uh, for their 2020 uh, uh, fashion collection. So you can, it's a little hard to tell on, on this photograph, but this is one of the main dresses for their uh, uh, 2020 collection. And my horse is printed on that. Um, that grew into doing, they, they came back to me and actually uh, uh, wanted to license a number of other pieces of my, my work under a collection that a uh, pretty cool thing that it, actually has my name attached to it. So it's not just Gucci wear, but it's Mark Burkhardt with Gucci. Um, and uh, so they, three of these four uh, pieces are licensed images uh, that existed already. They were all done for uh, fine art gallery contests. The uh, horse that you see, uh, it was sort of inspired by the previous piece. And that was a, a, com a commissioned piece from Gucci. And again, they kind of, they said, we really like this piece. We want you to do something different uh, than that with it though. And then otherwise left me alone to do what I wanted to do. Um, so it became a really terrific collaborative uh, uh, relationship. And next presenter is Yuko uh, Shimizu. And Yuko, I, you, you really almost, you don't, I feel like you don't even need an introduction, but I will give you one anyway. Um, uh, Yuko is a, a Japanese illustrator based in New York City. She's an instructor at the School of Visual Arts. Newsweek Japan has chosen Yuko as one of the 100 Japanese people the world respects in 2009. We still respect her even more now. Uh, her uh, first self-titled monograph came out in 2011. Uh, and the second monograph, Living with Yuka Shimizu, is released uh, by Rhodes Publishing. She's written and she's been involved in children's books, uh, uh, the uh, multi award winning children's book, uh, Barbed Wire Baseball, uh, Wild Swan. Uh, you've seen her work on Gap t shirts, Pepsi cans, Visa billboards, Apple, Microsoft, Nike, Target. Um, she's everywhere. Uh, and I think uh, if I'm correct, Yuka, this is like the 5,000th medal that you've won now. <laughs> uh, congratulations. Thank you. So with that, I'll, I'll let uh, Yuko uh, blow us away. So let, let me set my timer on my phone because we, it's already seven. So yeah. like I will do the stopwatch and like try to do it quick. Um, Wait, is it start? Okay. Um, hi, uh, thank you so much everyone for coming and thank you society for organizing this. And thank you everyone who is on the panel, but like, you know, most of all, thank you those people who came and like, I've been reading the chat and some of you came from abroad, you know, like Costa Rica. I read like people coming from all over the different places and this uh, pandemic suck, but at least, you know, like we will never be in the same room 
unless it happens. So try to look at the brighter side. Um, I will, well, like I don't really do a lot of surface design artwork. Actually, the the project that I, um, that got an award um, that from the society, I um, actually contacted the society and like, what category should I apply this to? And initially, I applied it to institutional because um, it is for like a museum. But then, like you know, we discussed again, like yeah, it should be in surface. So. Um, it's a weird project that doesn't belong anywhere. And I clearly remember, um, I'm sure Mark, you were there when we were adding surface design category, I forgot how many years that was, it doesn't seem like that long time ago. You know, we we're like, hey, like, you know, illustration is not just books and advertising and, you know, editorial and personal work anymore. There is this new category that we are ignoring and it's really not good. So we should start inviting people who do like surface design. And that's how it started. And I think, I think, you know, you and all the, the team and the society made the right decision. And I think it's interesting that it's quickly becoming like a whole new thing. So, um, Anyway, I will show my slide. So let me share my screen. And um, so uh, funny thing is like, I was thinking getting this thing together and actually exactly today, one year ago, I was on the Amtrak train going to Was uh, Washington DC with my dear, dear counting assistant who I cannot live without Tatiana Kodola, uh, two of us went to DC because this exhibit, uh, which has won the award uh, from the society was opening and we got invited to go to the opening. And so what it is, is like, it's hard to explain. There was like a short video. Um, I don't have a good video and, you know, like someone took video and I borrowed it. Like I have his name um, credited. So hopefully he will be okay. So Arctic House um, is located in Washington DC. That's the main branch. And then there is one in New York and there's one in Miami. So maybe people who are in Washington DC or New York has been there. And if you haven't seen what it is, it's really hard to explain, but uh, it's not animation, although it moves, it's not film and it's not illustration. And it's kind of a interactive uh, experience. So um, as you can see, the opening was March 13th. So uh, we went to the pre-opening on March 12th exactly a year ago. And then after three days, it got shut down. And obviously um, while we were on the train, like we thought, you know, like Washington DC is gonna be fine. New York's gonna be fine. We just gonna be careful. And that's what everyone said, but it closed. But like, I will show you um, sort of what it is. So uh, it's a room and there are multiple rooms in the space and the, uh, images are projected onto the whole wall. So you feel like you're in the space and they move, but it's not animation. They move and the, the people who go there can actually wave their body or hand and interact and elements move around. Um, and that's, that's the whole experience. So, you know, like, People ask me like, is that a mural? And like, no, it's not a mural. And, and it's like, it's it's really like hard to explain. And the, the funniest thing is, you know, I'm very proud of this project. And I'm uh, the fact that I've done it, not knowing what it is and myself. And I try to apply this to competitions and I don't know how, because um, society was pretty open about like how I apply to this, but like, some say it's like, oh yeah, it's an illustration competition. So you have to submit the full finished illustration. And I said, that doesn't exist. And then, well, it's if it's an animation, you have to submit the real, but it's not an animation, so it doesn't exist. So um, um, <laughs> it, 
yeah like so like i'll show you the still images first and then i will show you um the actual video someone took which will give you a better idea of what it is so there are multiple rooms and this guy's dancing around a girl uh anyway this person is dancing around and the elements on the wall moves as the person dances so what was great was uh he ended up reopening it got shut down after the opening and it got shut down for like three months and then we thought like it would never revive because you know like if you have been to arctic house it's kind of an elaborate space and you think oh these rich people are running it it's going to be okay but actually it's a small business started by two people one's from georgia not georgia the state but the georgia the country and another person came from uh, uh, Russia and they met in Washington, D.C. and they started like small art gatherings and somehow it got bigger and bigger and bigger over the years and they started and those founders, you know, employ a lot of people, but they still make all the decisions, you know, when I go there and when I, you know, go to the meeting, he and his wife, the, the partners, are the ones who come to the meeting, decide everything, says yes, no, let's do this, let's don't do this. So uh, I really thought like, not sure if we will survive, but then uh, it did. So this is a video um, taken by this guy in Instagram called Kid in Box. Uh, if you're kind enough, please visit his Instagram page. He's a young a uh, cinematographer uh, who goes into different spaces with friends and take videos and edit and post on social media and share with people. And he shared it with me and I saw other videos, but I really liked what he did. So uh, this is very, very short. So I uh, will play it. So I think you got the sense of what it is. So there are different rooms and there are selfie rooms. Like there was like a cherry, real, like real fake cherries, like combined with like blown up my drawings and things like that. But how it started was like, um, you know, like it's really weird how some project starts. Like you have heard from like everyone's talk before, like, you know, like you can't plan certain things. It just happens. And so, um, this is actually the I will I will speak as I show you this is the first mock-up and how I ended up doing this is like really weird so um last maybe eight or nine years um I have been speaking at a lot of like design and tech conferences and which is really weird because I'm not a designer and I'm not a tech person and uh if anyone's interested in doing that you know like thinking about like wanting to do something like that like i can talk to you some other time but um i really like to travel and then i thought like oh like you know going somewhere and travel and then like write it off as a business is a great idea so um i started like you know paying my way going to different places and like offer to you know speak to students or like do lecture or like look at some portfolio of the artists and then slowly starting getting invited to things and i don't know how i got invited to tech conferences it's really weird every time i go i love it and i hate it at the same time and uh, the reasoning is that um you know like so um i don't know if you know but i've been doing this for close to 20 years and i always feel like and marcus is my best friend from the start so like both of us are doing this for like 20 years and we know each other since we were just starting out and we always feel like we're still starting out but 
we're not. And, um, you know, like, so like people might know us in this, and then it's easy to get comfortable, right? Like people, like we all easy to get comfortable. And I really wanted to avoid it. You know, going into tech conferences, like all these amazing people and they don't know me. And then like, it's like going to like a new school as a kid, if you have ever done that, like it's like doing that every time you travel. And then you feel like you're like judged or ignored because, you know, they don't know me. They don't know what I do. And like, oh, there's an illustrator for speaker. And like, they usually throw in one illustrator or two because, you know, like if it's a conference about tech and it's all tech and it gets like little tiring. So we are there mostly as a like a casual coffee break entertainment, sort of like a panda bear who speaks, right, about different things. And, um, you know, it's really important for me to understand that, like, I'm, I'm nobody. And, and I really wanted to try out different things and be put myself in an uncomfortable situation to uh, get myself better as an artist. So I think it's a good way for me to experience. So when I went to these conferences, one of the first ones I went in Toronto called FITC, and it's all that techy, geeky stuff. And you start making friends, you know, like try out my best to do good talk and then go to see other people's talk, try to talk to them. And one of the guys, you know, really cool, um, you know, digital artists who do not the digital art, like, you know, digital paintings, but the, 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 the um, coded work. And this guy, like Jason White is a guy who I met and we kind of were friendly for a while. And then he started working for Art Tech House and they needed to do the Cherry Blossom Festival thing. So he's like, oh, um, can you, can you come and then like, can we work on this together? And so we did this first mock-up and then the, the owners, you know, the founders came in like, uh, you know, like this is not it. But, and then I was like, what do you, what do you want? I don't even know how this thing works. And then they gave me this, like, this is the room. You know, like there are walls and it's like three, three walls. Uh, come up with something. And then like, I was totally left alone. And so it was kind of a weirdest project I did, but then I really wanted to do this. I actually didn't have a lot of time when this was um, happening. Like I had other deadlines and it was kind of madness to take this project, but I took this not only because Jason called me and it, um, you know, it's nice that people who you met calls me for something different, but um, it, it, it has started maybe like seven or eight years before that. Uh, I always work listening to NPR programs, and um, I was fascinated by this one segment. They were talking about kids who are born today. That was like, you know, like maybe seven, eight years ago maybe like more than half of them will end up growing up and having a job that doesn't even exist in this world. And I was like, like, holy shit, you know, like, oh my God. And, you know, here I am sitting in front of my drawing desk and drawing with ink and brush on paper. I do use Photoshop to color, but like, you know, I'm pretty traditional and also like, to think about the broadest definition of illustration, like everything before they actually made like fine art as fine art was illustration, right? Uh, Egyptian, you know, like these Egyptian art to tell the story or even cave art, like, you know, how to hunt, you know, like Bible, like every picture or like the Greek, statues to tell the stories of God. So if you think about the broadest definition of illustration, illustration is one of the oldest, um, longest art career that is going on. So like, I always felt like I'm a, 
I'm a um, mammoth or like dinosaur. And then this thing when Jason contacted me, like this might be not my, not only my chance to actually experience what the NPR segment said, but also, you know, like everyone here knows if you do illustration, like people has been saying illustrations dying for like what, like 20, 30 years. Um, don't worry, it's still not dead, so it will never die. But then I feel like I've been doing this for 20 years or so, I'm not a newbie anymore. And I feel like there is a responsibility for me, not just for myself, but for the whole industry. And when I think of that, this was like the biggest chance. And if I said no, I don't know who will take this job and most probably not an illustrator. And this was like just too good of an opportunity to pass. So anyway, um, I did these sketches and I thought like they will pick one and they came back and like, you know, I wasn't sure what I was doing. They came back and said like, oh, we like these as like segment and like sequence and like what? So like, yeah, we're gonna take them all. And then like, holy shit. And then so, um, I ended up um, working, you know, like I worked on this like on and off for like a month, like last winter in January. And I should have like, you know, like talk too much about hard work, but like sometimes, you know, like hard work that is that you're doing for yourself and hard work that you're forced by and um, a company that you work for, which I did before I became an illustrator, is completely different. So it's something I voluntarily decided to work hard. And for about a month, I took subway in the morning, but it was too late to take subway at night. So I took cab for about a month. And my coloring assistant uh, took a space next to me and she was constantly working for me. And without her, uh, it would not have been finished. So everything is a separate element. So like, this is a drawing, but then like this drawing looks like it's a piece, but it's like separated into like eight pieces and they're in layers. And then like they use those each element and color them and they program them and code them and move. And so um, it's interesting because like, the final one, you know, like finished illustration does not exist. So these are all separate element colored in and like here, this is like a mood color, use this and uh, move them around. So there are cherries, I drew them a lot more and then, you know, they multiply them, they flip them, they change the size and move. So butterflies are, in a mirrored wings and then they use that to make them flatter so um so now you see like you know what of each elements are in there and you know like i we were basically i did go to the opening and i wanted to go back after they opened but uh, because, you know, we're quarantined and I, I couldn't, but the best thing that happened was when it was um, reopened and they reopened it for quite a long time, the whole summer up to the beginning of uh, fall. Uh, the best thing I do is I wake up each morning and eat breakfast and look at my Instagram and all these people who are able to visit uh, tag me and our tech house and take selfies videos you know dance around and show me that how much they're enjoying and that was that like saved my summer you know last summer um but anyways so they were really happy the arctic house was happy so um you know like my job is done but hopefully this will open up to you guys you know, whoever you are here today, who are illustrators or interested in illustration, um, you know, the illustration is not dying. It's changing, like everything else is changing. This would not have been existed 
just even two, three years ago. And now it does. And it can be, you can do something like this too. So, um, you know, like uh, as a mid career, mature career illustrator, I have to think of the future and responsibility. And I think of that a lot. And hopefully it will help you in the future. So with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you, Yuko. That was really incredible. And it, it's kind of at the same time, kind of tragic that you haven't been able to like spend time in this space. It's like a dream to have your art sort of moving around you. And um, uh, I think actually one of the questions that I saw pop up was uh, if you are aware, is there, are there any plans to, to uh, bring that to a, another location? So um, they're very open. They're very open. They spend a lot of effort making that work. So they're open, but um, it depends on the, you know, the, the organization or whoever wants to invite because it's, it has to have a lot of technological facility and tech people in order for this to travel. It's not like a, you know, traveling show that you can pack up and open up and put it up on the wall and it works, it won't. So um, there are a lot of offers, but um, it is not that easy. Right. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine that that's an incredibly complicated uh, process. I, I, I'd also be interested in, in to what degree you, and I mean, you covered a little bit, but to what degree you're sort of involved as a director of your images, sort of reviewing based on, on for example, where you had like mood coloring, you know, then sort of seeing what they've done with it and giving feedback. Um, they pretty much left me alone. Like, you know, like, like oh, it, everything you guys said, like, you know, like I'm the artist, make the, the images, but if there is not enough cherries, you know, we need more cherries or we need more waves and, then the rest they did, and I, I did go to the opening, and you know each scene is completely different. So there is like a transition scene, and then like you know water comes up at the bottom of oh, the cherry blossom, like it's like all over and cover the screen, and then get sparse, and the next scene shows up, and people were really, really, including myself were amazed by the transition scene, which they just did it as a transition. So the only thing I asked was like, the transition is too quick because they just did it to transition. Like people love it, I love it. Like everyone's like, oh, we ended already. So can you elongate that? And that was like the only um, request I have made. Okay. And, and during three months it was closed they worked on a lot more so that the room the person was dancing and the cherries move around like you know kaleidoscope that didn't exist when i went but they worked on it um uh while it was closed and they did a few other things i don't have videos there was like a one on the floor there's like a water and then if you like put the hand the water moves and the oh, cool. flowers move and those like they they did a lot of work after wow that sounds like an absolutely amazing experience uh you and marcus both sort of touched on this i guess a little bit but I, I one of the other questions that i saw uh pertain to and i know this is always a tricky thing for for as, as artists to discuss, although I think in a lot of ways it's really important and basic. Um, uh, some people asked about budgeting and, and sort of a um, how do you manage something where you have uh, at least initially, you know, an open ended process like like yours, Yuka, where you're, you know, they keep coming back and saying, hey, we need more, or in your case, Marcos, when you were dealing with different fabricators, you know, it's sort of figuring out how you parse up the budget that you are given. So uh, to what extent uh, do, do you guys, all three of you, uh, you know, has your experience, uh, what's been your experience and have you sort of thought through those issues uh, and working on a project like this? Um, Yuko, you wanna answer okay. first? And yeah, jump so in. Um, 
it's a funny thing that like you know i'm experienced so like i don't start anything without like contract or like you know budget right like you know what's your budget there that's like you know if you're starting out you're here you're starting out you don't feel like you want to talk about money you have to talk about money right so like we always start from you know like what's your budget you know what's the scope of work and what's the schedule and then we say yes no more money more time whatever but this was a weird one that I said yes without even knowing what the budget was because I thought if I said no, anything like this might never come to me or any other illustrator. So um, I actually, I have an agent and Marcus and I have the same agent and he doesn't involve with everything, but like something like this, the scope is unknown. I usually have him involved and you know, I was like, here, Aaron, take care of it. And then I was already working in like, Yuko, you can't do that. You know this, like, you know, I'm still negotiating the money. Like, what if they come back and say there is zero money? And which is true, I should never do that. But in this case, I didn't care because the most important thing is an illustrator do this. So um, they actually only had a set budget, which is like, okay, it was not great, but it was like, okay, you know, fine. You know, like I can pay my bills uh, kind of budget. I mean, like, I mean, like more than okay. I don't know, like, you know, like it was not as, you know, in the perfect world, he should have paid more, but in per world is not perfect. And I was committed to do it. I probably shouldn't say the amount in front of everyone, but like it was totally fine for me, although my agent was not happy. Like, let me put it that way. And, but like- You've got a good agent that should never be happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he, he was like, oh, like they said, like it's the set budget. And then like, you know, like, I'm like, fine. You know, like for this, I don't care. You know, the most important thing is me or any other illustrator an illustrator do it. So this was a weird one. Oh. Marcus, what, for you, is it really just sort of, because I would imagine that when you went in, you, you knew your budget and then you knew that you had to work with a lot of people to sort of visualize your, your project, but you did, probably didn't have any idea of how many people and how many things you would have to, to tackle. Right. I think that for that particular project for uh, Percent for Public Art, um, it's very standard. It's a, it's a government you know, project. And so they give you a set budget. They give you, I think someone in the, in the chat was asking about um, list of fabricators. Did I have to source them out? They really had a great resource because they've been doing this since I think the early eighties. And so I tapped into that resource. Um, one advice that I was given was to open up a separate bank account for the money that I would be receiving from um, SCA. Um, because kind of like, a, like a contractor in a house would do. Or, yeah, well, I mean, in some ways, right? You're yeah, I mean, making some money and and then doing things with it that isn't necessarily going into your pocket. Yeah, because the thing is, you know, they the way that it works is they each each project's different, and so um, and they release funds throughout. So this project lasted for two years, so they release funds every several months, and you're responsible for paying people. So um, that's why they suggested it, so I wouldn't have to dip into my own bank account. So that was an unusual thing, um, but also in terms of pricing, sort of to tag off of what Yuko said, and also what Sebastian said as well. Um, Yuko, in terms of you know, there isn't, it's not, it's not so binary in terms of should I take it or shouldn't I not take it because they're not paying me enough. It goes beyond that. You know, it's way more nuanced. And for this particular project, it wasn't that I didn't believe that I would never get another public art project. But at that moment, it's really something that I kind of put out in the universe and wanted to do. And with that in mind, sort of tagging off of Sebastian's talk, you know, you were doing this project because you wanted to and you were on your honeymoon, you know, and your wife didn't even divorce you, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I was doing this too, when I was in Brazil with Yuko, when I was traveling as well, it was just one of those things where you kind of have to, you know, put other things on the scale and decide what you know has value for you and because it did have so much value what i ended up doing is in terms of division of time i ended up um i'm very sort of set with my work hours and 
but with this, I had to at some points lengthen my day or night, you know, so um, that's just kind of comes with the business. Yeah, I think I think that's that's probably a, a given in almost every situation. And I think you guys all, probably all know James Victoria, the designer and good friend and has often said, I don't know if it's originally his quote, but I attribute it to him. And he said, there are jobs you do for God and jobs you do for money. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they meet. Uh, and those, ideally they would meet, uh, but that isn't always the case, but we have to, as artists sort of, um, you know, balance those, uh, the rewards that our project offers. Sebastian, did you, uh, I mean, you did so many sketches in so many different directions. Was that something that you would normally do? I mean, I, I would think in, I don't know how much editorial you do or other people do, uh, uh, but uh, you know, time frame alone yeah. uh, rules a lot of those possibilities out. So, what was that like for you? Uh, yeah, I usually I usually do a lot of sketches. Um, you know, I think my background is pretty weird. I I worked for animation for ten years, so when I started drawing, I felt that one drawing was just too little for me to explore and maybe for the client to take a, a decision. So, and, and usually on animation, you just create a huge volume of, of, of work, you know, before going to the client or something. So I don't know, I, I, I think naturally I started doing like 10, 20 things. I also, my style, you know, is not very virtuous. It's very simple. So it's more about maybe an idea or a feeling or emotion. It's, it's very expressive. So. Um, I just started drawing a lot and I think, I don't know, I kind of like discover a better relationship with the client because I present a lot of options and a lot of work. And in a first round, that's just kind of like sets the mood for uh, kind of like a positive vibe. You know, they, they, they love to have a bunch of options um, and we just discuss uh, what feels better. You know, sometimes it's a tiny difference, but some of the times are, are just big changes. Uh, on the, I remember on the Warby Parker store, I wanted to go with those goose flying and kind of like that weird stuff. Um, that wasn't originally on, on, on any kind of brief or any kind of uh, reference, but I thought that I, I discovered that, you know, just sketching and, and just thinking about the project. So maybe you could get away sometimes, you know, with a, with a very weird proposal for the client and you could also present a safe alternative, you know, and, and you have kind of like a bunch of stuff to show to the client. I, I feel, I don't know, it's just like a way richer way of working with the client, right? You present more work. It is more work also, but yeah. uh, I, I really enjoy to, to draw. If, yeah, if you love what you do, it makes the, makes the work easier. Yeah, yeah, for me, for me it's the most, I don't know which part do you like the most, but for me it's that first, uh, part you know like the first proposal that you you're gonna do is kind of like the more creative part of the process is the part that where you you show yourself uh, you set the mood for the pro I don't know like I, I feel that that first stage of the project where you start sketching uh, that's awesome and from that point you know you have a collaboration going on with the client but that first part is it's all you and for me that's very important so I, I take care of a lot of that. That's stage. Great. Yeah, I I think you know, Yuka, if I'm not mistaken, you you know, on uh, recently in social media, they had a little bit of a discussion about that whole idea of of does an artist work, you know, and that is it really work what we're doing? And of course it is, and it's a tremendous amount of of time and energy and effort, and and it can also be frustrating. It's ultimately very gratifying work. So, um, uh. I know you guys touched a little bit on this, but I, I wanted to ask again if you had any any uh, suggestions. I mean, a lot of the people that are, are watching are are uh, younger artists or, or students, and, and uh, might be interested in sort of how how you go about getting into this side of the field. Um, and that's something that that I think um, for me it was it's been a as I described it a very organic thing. But I don't know if for you. If for you and and then the second part of that question is. Once you once you have done that, that those kinds of projects, it becomes a part of your your work. How are you then changing the way you're approaching that, if if at all, or how you're presenting it to to clients? Is that as a growing body of your work? So just jump in there and tell me what you think. 
Yuko or Sebastian? Mark, you haven't. You are I was going to say you're only answering the question. So you should answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, was it or I mean, for you, Yuko, was it really an organic thing, for example? To, organic to uh, in in terms of, uh, I mean, there are a lot of. Uh, I have this question a lot from from young artists and from students. They they say, should I create? For book jackets, for example, should I create a, a book jacket, and, or should I create something that targets this market or that market? And obviously, surface and product is a very different kind of market. Uh, I mean, my approach has been kind of a great lucky one in that you know I'm producing work for myself that then inspires people to use it in a different way that I might not have ever imagined. But uh, but then once you have that work in your in your body of work. Then you have to sort of separate that out and show clients that that exists. So for you guys, was it an organic thing? Uh, just sort of, I know Sebastian, you said you were working with them on print-oriented stuff. And, um, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. Um, let me think. Uh, it's a bit weird for me, you know, because I, I, I was like a recognized animation director at some point. So for me, it wasn't organic because I had to switch. Like I should start, I didn't know how to draw. You know, I'm not a drawer. I, I started to draw when I decided to be an illustrator. It was kind of like a weird thing to, to take on. Um, so it wasn't organic at all. Um, it was more like uh, deciding to go to the gym, you know, something like that. Okay, I'm gonna start diet on Monday. It was something like that. Uh, and then, um, but it was for myself. It wasn't uh, a thing that started um, with a commercial purpose. You know, I, I had my animation thing. That was my day job. And then I had my illustration thing that was interesting for me. Uh, but at some point, um, I always joke, I always uh, put that stuff on Tumblr on, on Instagram. And at some point, the uh, clients started to send me emails, uh, not for animation, for the illustration stuff. And that was a bit um, uh, weird for me. You know, I was expecting to to do commercial animation. So. Uh, of course that I accepted, you know, it, it was great. I would do it for free anyways. Uh, and at some, yeah, for sure. Uh, and at some point, uh, the, no <laughs> <laughs> just, just take it out. Uh, <laughs> uh, so at some point, uh, it got very weird because it, it started to compete like the money that I would do on my night job, we started to compete with my day job. And I just felt that I could make the switch and try to be a commercial illustrator. Um, but I, but I, yeah, I don't know, but I, but I think it wasn't organic uh, at all. You know, I just tried to push stuff outside that once I saw the potential uh, to make a living of it. Of it. Uh, I was, uh, I'm very close to animation and motion graphics. So I tried to, to get into that industry, you know, uh, illustration for those purposes. Uh, but I, I think I really resonate with what, with what you said, um, you know, creating work for yourself, you see a value on that, you show it, and someone is gonna see that value, you know, and, and for sure the purpose can change, you know, I'm not aware of the uses of my illustrations at all. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I started licensing stuff. I didn't know that that stuff existed. Uh, I never licensed anything uh, before uh, starting doing drawing. Yeah. That that's actually segues nicely into one of the questions that, that uh, when the attendees has asked about about licensing in general and, and uh, secondary licensing of, of images. And I know all of you guys have done this and do this. Um, so it's not just that you know art uh, can inspire clients uh, to commission you for a new piece, but that uh, often they'll come to you and say, "This one piece we'd really like to use in a different context." Um, uh, so we talked a little bit about that, but I think it's always a good thing. I'm a big advocate of, of you know, underscoring that, you know, particularly for younger artists, that what we're doing is not, you know, you're not paid by the hour. Uh, you're not uh, paid. If people aren't really buying an original piece of art from you. What they're doing is they're buying a, a license to use a piece. So, you're, you know, in the case of me, I've got, I've got, I, I like to sell my original paintings, but I have an awful lot of paintings that that exist that are not really, don't have a gallery context for them. They've been commissioned by clients. I keep those original paintings. Um, so talk maybe just a little bit about your thoughts on, on that, on sort of learning the, the business and the law side of, of being an artist. Uh, Marcos, 
Sure. I don't have much experience with this, but one thing that I do know and have done is um, with uh, certain friends and people who I trust, I always reach out when I don't know. And they do that for me as well. And so licensing is one of them. Um, just asking questions about, you know, sharing or sharing information about pricing. Um, my agent as well, asking, you know, people like him or them for question, uh, questions uh, in regards to that. Um, but that's, you know, the only information I have about licensing, to be quite honest. I've been to like print trade shows and that type of thing, but it's not, you know, the, the way that they do things aren't, isn't the way that I would, because um, in those particular types of shows where you just sell stacks and stacks and stacks of prints, it's all sort of, you know, um, priced at a sort of standard rate, depending on what they want to use it for. So I'm more into creating something, um, owning it, and then having someone want to you know license it from me instead of sort of selling in this kind of like yeah. machine type of a way right and i mean i i know um, from my experience when i started out uh when i started out in the field it was did a lot of book jacket work i still do book jacket work but it was almost exclusively uh book jacket work when i began and, um and that was something i learned very early on was the value of you really were being commissioned to do uh, art that was going to go on a hardcover uh, but you retained all the, the future rights. So if it went into paperback and, and some, some publishers uh, even early were, uh, you know, you would build into a contract percentage that you would receive if it went to paperback or if it went to audio rights. And there are, there are pieces of art that I've been making money off of for <coughs> my entire career that were done from early in, in my career. And so I think that's a really important lesson to, to sort of underscore for, for younger artists that, that, you know, it's understandable that big companies, as even as they get bigger, uh, one of the things they invest in is attorneys uh, who would, you know, write up contracts that are, uh, you know, ideally they're purchasing everything up front from you, and probably at a rate that that may only apply to the one thing that you're doing. So it's really important to learn what's the value of of what you're licensing, what can you hang on to, and what potential does it have in the future, um, which. You'd mentioned Marcus, your your agent, but um, there, there was also a question about: are, are all of us? Do we all have agents? Um, you guys, just jump in there and let us know what your situation yeah. is. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have an agent. I could say, you know, that uh, maybe I'm like the youngest illustrator here, um, and I'm really close to not having an agent or to a starting because I'm kind of starting. Uh, so, um, I would say that pricing, you know, it's very hard, but there, there's not really a way to, to, to learn, uh, rather than price stuff, you know, and just work low volume stuff. And then you just get better, uh, at your work. And I feel that pushes the value of your work, you know, and you get more recognizable. You, you kind of like, uh, win awards, you know, and you, you get exposure. And that makes um, that makes way easier your work. You know, at some point maybe you get an Asian, and your Asian um, can help you creating contracts. You know, redacting contracts and and just negotiating um, license of uses. I am pretty amazed. You know, at, at how the illustration business works because I wasn't aware of it. Um, but um, I feel there is no other way. You know, it's not that you could uh, ask a friend and your friend's going to say, I don't know, price is uh, $10,000. And you could go with your work and price that $10,000 because it, it is per case by case and it changed. Uh, European markets are different than US markets and then uh, fashion brands are different than tech brands and outdoor advertising is different than print advertising, right? Or editorial is very different to commercial. So you, you could find some standard um, quotes you know, but, but it's, it is really uh, case by case, you know, and, and I feel um, there is no other way, you know, and, it, and it's nothing wrong about uh, just pricing your stuff very low and then just building up, you know, you're going to get aware at some point. Um, at least that's my experience. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, I mean, I have an agent that I work with in, in England. We do just a few projects uh, per year, but they're bigger projects and, and we really mm -hmm. focus on, on advertising projects and, and um, 
things with larger budgets. And otherwise, I've always managed my business myself, and, and mostly in the United States, managed it myself. And I find that's that's pretty been a pretty practical one. Uh, I agree with you that you know you need to talk to talk to other people, ask other people, find out their experience. That's the only way that you're going to get knowledge about pricing. Um, I think it's good to get to know other artists like you guys. Uh, so I know Yuko, I've uh, asked you a few times when there were projects that is something out of my, my experience that I know that you've worked in that market to get a, a relative sense of, of where pricing ought to be. Uh, and I think that's, that's a really helpful thing. And I'm a big advocate for artists. Uh, I like I say great agents in England, but I'm a big advocate for artists sort of taking charge of their own careers. And I, and I always tell young students or new artists that are coming out in the marketplace, you're worth every bit as much as I am or, or Marcos is or anybody. If somebody wants to, to publish your work, then you're a professional at least in the terms of the quality. And then the question is, are you gonna be a pro professional in terms of actually being paid for it? Uh, and that really is, a, it's a tough thing to learn, but I think agents are, are, are helpful, particularly on big projects uh, where, you know, if I'm working, I'm working on a project, I'm about to start a project, a big project in England that will take many weeks. Uh, and just the time difference alone, it's really helpful to have somebody there to, to negotiate things and all the, fingers that are in a pie. Um, but I think it's also a very manageable thing for individual artists to do. Can I, can I, yeah. can I say stuff about it? Because like I'm really passionate about this topic and we can do another talk, whole talk yeah. about agent. Yeah. I didn't have an agent for like first five to six years, maybe. And I didn't, at that point, I, it wasn't my plan on getting an agent. And Marcus and I teach together. By the way, Marcus said we did go to Brazil together. We're not a couple. <laughs> We're best <laughs> friends. Just to clarify. We slept but anyway, on the same um, bed. <laughs> yeah, we slept on the same bed, but like we're we're friends. Okay. Um, so but anyway, um I I we we teach together and we tell students like in the beginning, you probably don't need agents because like you know, like. I mean, like if you get like a big client, big ad job, great. But like the chances are you usually don't get that right at the beginning. You know, you start working for like small newspapers and magazines and like, you know, book covers and then people slowly get to know you and they might want to use you for a bigger project, right? And so like magazines, newspapers and books have budget. They call you and tell you, this is the project, this is the article, this is the schedule. We need a sketch by this day, we need the final by this day, we pay this much. And if they have the contract, here's the contract. So you don't need to negotiate anything. And then after a while you're doing that and then like, you know, smaller magazine coming, the budget is not great. And then you already have an experience to say, hey, you know, this budget, like, I usually get thousand dollars, but you're offering seven hundred. So you know, is there a wiggle room? I really want to do this. So you start learning how to, you know, what your price is and how to negotiate. And so, like, you can do that. And then what happens is, like, a lot of our former students, you know, they do that, and then then they get contacted by big clients. And then they contact us or anyone who they know. And then like, you know, can I ask you for advice? Mm -hmm. And then we try our best to give advice and do like email back and forth. So like, you know, like, um, you know, learning as you go is good. And it's not that like, I'm trying to dismiss Sebastian's like, um, experience but it is also important to give the price point when you are working on ad jobs and bigger projects you need to pitch your price but then you know Marcus has an experience he pitched the right price but he lost the job because someone wrote lowball right and you know like those things happen and you know, once or twice, it's okay. You know, we all learn by experience. But then if someone keeps lowballing because they're not experienced yet, 
it's one time for them, but for artists, your clients, oh, like artists are like, you know, really okay working for a small amount of money. And that's kind of the reason why people are saying illustration industry is dying, right? So we have obligations as professionals to help the, the younger generation not do that and keep the rate high. Like Mark said, if you get a job from Gucci, regardless of you have Mark's experience or you started out last year, your fee should be the same or at least close to the same. And so, you know, ask people, if you went to art school, ask people who you studied with, your friends, your professors, and maybe they don't know, but maybe they know someone who knows. You know, when Mark and I talked about, you know, Mark had some questions about the licensing, and I actually didn't have that experience. But then we were talking and like, like oh, I don't know, but, I know like we can think of this person we both know who has experience and you talk to her and she gave you know like I'm happy to help because you know like we have to get this industry going so it, it's very very important and also like what young artists should know is if you're pitching for a bigger big job and you're like almost like, you know, they're not unserious, they're pretty serious, although you might not get it or get it. Agents, experienced agents are usually okay to work on one-time basis if they don't represent you, because for them, negotiating the ad job is really easy and they get percentage, you could say 20%, you know, because I, we don't represent you, but then they get 20% for, you know, no work at all while you have zero idea. So those things, I, I want the younger artists to know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would also say uh, uh, that, you know, my experience early on was that, uh, and, I, and it's still the case, uh, and, and the evidence is right in front of me with the three of you, that illustrators are, are very open and, and generous people. And uh, I, I know I was able to reach out to many of my heroes really at the beginning when I was a student uh, and, a, and a young artist and they were happy to see me and talk with me and you know they're busy people and you have to respect their time uh, and their availability but I found that that for the most part people were very open in our field and, and happy to talk with you and so I think that's use that resource you know to talk to people and and uh do it with respect and, and choose the people that you know uh, are, are going to be able to give you good insight based on their experience. Uh, but I think that's the best way to learn um, is talk to other people who've already learned um, and get their, their sense of it. Um, guys, I, I think we could probably do this all night long, but <laughs> I people got deadlines too. And for all I know, our entire audience has disappeared. So, <laughs> but for uh, uh, those of you who are still out there, uh, thanks so much for um, joining us. And thanks you, you three, uh, for um, Thank you, Mark. amazing presentations. Thank you, Mark. Work. Congratulations to you all. Uh, it's gonna be weird to, to not be able to, we're gonna all virtually have a ceremony this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you guys again then, uh, but uh, hopefully in person soon again too. Fingers crossed. <laughs> and thank you, Society thank you. and Lindsay, for organizing this. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. I don't know you. if Lindsay, you've got any anything you want to add here at the end, or no? I think um, you did a great job covering at least most of the questions. I know we didn't get to every single one, but. It was such a great talk, really inspiring. So many great things in the chat. I'll send it to you guys so you can see all the, the wonderful comments. And we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with everybody and share your experiences. And it's really invaluable. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thank it's an honor to have been asked. Thank you guys. And everybody Thanks. get back to work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.